You know, there's a text in the scripture and to my dear friend Jody, uh, who we talk all the time about these issues. Uh, we've often heard it said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Actually, that is a rephrasing of what Jesus actually said. And I wanna take a moment to talk about what he actually said, because Jesus had a choice. Um, you know, in the scriptures, it tells us that Jesus literally could have loosed uh, 10,000 angels like a nuclear bomb upon those who were trying to crucify him. But he chose not to. He was challenging the empire, but he knew that he could not be like the empire if he was going to challenge the empire. In fact, there's this interesting text in the Bible that says when they first grabbed Jesus, he flinched for a moment. He, he flinched. He, he, he allowed his his spiritual power to flinch. And it says all the soldiers fell out like dead men. And then he stepped back and said, no, this has to be a nonviolent way. I, have, I cannot use the ways of the empire to stop the empire. And so when Jesus was being captured by the empire, by the Roman empire, that at that time, <clears throat> Uh, was led by narcissistic ego, ego maniacs and demagogues who literally um, named their weapons because in the ver their version, their understanding of creation uh, that traced all the way back to the ancient Babylon, <clears throat> they believed that war was the process of creation. We, many people still do. They literally believed that war was the process of creation. In fact, in the ancient Babylonian um, concept of creation, uh, two gods went to war and it was out of the murder of one, vicious, violent murder of one, that creation was born. Uh, in the Jewish Judeo-Christian uh, version of creation, God, the spirit of God brings order to chaos and creation is born out of nonviolence and not violence. But the Roman Empire believed that violence was the way and they could not have this group of people then acting like the Massachusetts Peace Action Group saying it didn't have to be this way. And this powerful leader that was doing what Larry Cohen just said, organizing the people because his influence was starting to reach inside even the pockets of power. And so they came to take him. And one of his followers was Peter. And Peter had been a part of the guerrilla warfare team that stood against the Roman Empire, the Maccabeans. So though, though Peter was following this guy nonviolently, Jesus, he kept a sword. And he, when they grab Jesus, he cuts his ear of the person who grabs an ear off. And Jesus says to him, here's the actual text put up thy sword, put it back in your, its place for all those that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Not, all, not those who, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. That's not the quote. The quote from Jesus is all those that take. And the word there in Greek is says all those that use, all those that grab on, to violence as their way of existing. All of those who put their hope in, the, in their weaponry shall perish by that same weaponry. All for they that take, they that think their safety is in their ability to wield violence more powerfully than someone else will perish by the same thing they willed. Because the same thing you willed, others will then begin to believe that's their safety and they will build some and you will build some and they will build some and you will build some. And after a while, the sum that you have will par cause the perishing of everybody. I've been thinking about what that means and I went back and read 
as you know, Eisenhower's speech about the congressional. And it's interesting that Cohen, uh, Cohen laid it out because you know we often um, um, we often reduce that quote and say military industrial conflict. That's not the original quote. The original quote of Eisenhower was the congressional military industrial complex. That was the quote. They pulled that out, but that's what he was literally saying in that final speech before he left presidency. But there are some other things he said. He said, we annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporations. All United States corporations. We spend more on the military. He then said in 61, this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is, is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. And it was interesting to me that he said, even spiritual. And that's when you know you have devolved into an empire is when even your spirituality is determined by your weaponry. Spirituality is supposed to call us back, give us some, put some, put some, um, what we used to call um, governors. When I used to drive a school bus, they had a governor on it. And they made it so the school bus couldn't go any faster than 45 miles an hour. It didn't matter how hard you pushed it. But when spirituality is linked to war and militarism, then spirituality actually promotes the violence and gives cover for it endorses it, makes it a religion, not just an economic venture, but building a greater weapon, building a greater nuclear weapon literally becomes a matter of from people's faith, their religion, their God. And when God and money are the same thing, that's a terrible connection. He then went on to say, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought by the congressional military complex. Now, I, that, I stopped for that because he said unwarranted influence, sought or unsought. It was a sense that the military and the congressional military industrial complex left to itself will become a spirit that will take over things that even good people won't even realize how they're being controlled by. It. It'll become so powerful that it doesn't even have to intentionally, intentionally seek influence. The influence will be given. And he said the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. And then I saw this line that I had not heard. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel. The only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry because the one thing empire mentality seeks to do is lull the citizenry to sleep, is lull the citizenry to apathy, which we cannot afford. He wrote this in 61, but it is just as important 50, 50 years, 50 what, 50 years later, 60 years later. 1961 was when it was written. So when I look at this and we are a nation, Dr. King said this in 67. And, and, and you know, um, again, I'm referencing some stuff. I was listening to Larry when he was talking about where who gets paid and where they got paid and how they started out being good people. People forget that when Dr. King said this line, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death, is approaching spiritual death. There's two things we ought to know about that. First of all, what is spiritual death? 
in my tradition and the tradition Dr. King was speaking from, spiritual death is not just, you know, you don't pray or you don't sit down and, and seek nirvana or you um, don't ask God for blessings. That's not what spiritual death is. In the context in the King was talking about spiritual death is when you develop a consciousness that says, I don't care who has to die as long as I get my weapons. Spiritual death is when you no longer care for the poor and the, and the, and the hurting and the broken. That, 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 that those things are pushed away from the center of our existential um, uh, uh, realities that, 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 that they don't matter anymore. All that matters is how much money, how much power, and how much death can I create? You know, because ultimately racism is about power, money, militarism, racism, poverty, those three evils. Spiritual death is when we don't address those issues. Spiritual death is when, when, when pulpits and places of, of proclamation become silent to those issues. Spiritual death is when we don't cure our warring madness. We don't even try to cure it. We want more of it. We want to be more infected by a warring madness. And this constant giving in, this constant taking hold of the sword will drive a nation crazy to the point she doesn't even know she's crazy. And that's what spiritual death is. Spiritual death is also when it grows year after year, he said. And, 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 and you should know that when Dr. King spoke those words as a part of his time to break silence, this is what we don't talk about. 160 newspapers wrote articles against him the next day and continued. He immediately lost his invitation to the White House. And here's another part you don't know, people don't talk about. Almost every civil rights organization and even his own denomination stood against him. because they too were getting funding from the military industrial complex. The major civil rights organizations wrote, article, wrote resolutions against Dr. King's stance. When he said, we gotta deal with poverty, militarism and racism. Black civil rights organizations attacked him. Not just the white community, not just the military, not just the president, not just the proponents of the Vietnam War. He, by the end of the year, Dr. King was in a very, very lonely place. And when he came to the Poor People's Campaign, he was basically gathering the renegades of various places, welfare rights workers, people in the war movement some people in the certain Jewish federations, Latinos like Cesar Chavez and some of the native people. But you should know that when he said, dare to say the truth, America, you are approaching spiritual death because you're spending more money on military defense than on programs with social uplift. That clear, concise criticism of the culture cause not only the, the expected enemies, but the unexpected enemies. In a piece we did called The Souls of Poor Folk, the Poor People's Campaign did a whole section because we in the Poor People's Campaign say that there are five interlocking injustices, five interlocking evils, poverty, systemic racism. And we talk about racism in all of its forms from how black systemic racism toward black people, brown people, Asian people, native people, Latino people, and the collateral damage done to white people and how racism is ultimately 
targeted at people of color, but it's actually a hatred for humanity and a hatred for the democracy itself. And then systemic poverty, Liz has talked about that earlier, I'm sure today, ecological devastation, denial of healthcare, and the war economy, and then the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And in that study that we did called The Souls of Poor Folk, one of the contributors said weapons of war and their, their capabilities are keeping some of our influential leaders starry-eyed and willing to spend billions on them with a disregard similar to that of purchasing 4th of July fireworks. Meanwhile, the parts of government that serve the poor and middle class are effectively shut down. Effectively shut down. This should break the hearts of everyone and compel a revolt at the ballot box. Let me talk about this war economy in context of COVID, which I think we should do more of. We have all this military budget. We have all these nuclear weapons. The United States alone could probably blow the world up a hundred times. Seems to me one time is enough. Uh, I know two would be surely enough, but a hundred times. All this weaponry, but not one of them can stop a germ that looks like a tennis ball with dreadlocks. That's what COVID looks like. All this power, we've, 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 Jesus said, if you take a hold of it, you'll perish by it. All this power, and what are we told? To protect us, to keep us alive, to sustain us. We need to be able to blow the world up a hundred times. And yet all of this, not one of those nuclear bombs can stop a little teeny germ that looks like a tennis ball with dreadlocks as Bishop Flunder says. All this money in the militarism and we don't have the capacity in the hospitals and health systems to deal with the influx of patients according to scholars from all over John Hopkins, we find out in the midst of this pandemic, you know, the pandemic exposed the fissures of poverty, racism, and how bad our public health systems really are. Federal funding for emergency preparedness and health care has been on the decline for 15 years while the military budget has kept, keeps going up, 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 up. If you take hold to the sword, you'll perish by the sword, which doesn't mean you necessarily will be blown up. That's what people miss. It doesn't mean if you take hold of the sword, you're going to be blown up or killed by another sword. I mean, you take hold of the sword, you put all the money in a sword, then you're going to leave other things undone that will destroy you. The amount of federal funds given to state and local officials to prepare for health emergency has been cut in half, cut in half, or more over the past couple of decades, according to Crystal Watson, senior scholar at John Hopkins. The two key federal programs amounted to $1.4 billion. These are public health programs in 2003. And by 2017, those programs have been cut to $662 million. They went from $1.4 million billion to $662 million. But military, military budgets haven't been cut. And she goes on to say every administration has made cuts to these programs. It has been a downward trend for a long time. And because the decision was made to take hold of the sword, we've now had more people die than in World War II. As we took hold of the sword, and we let go of caring for our people. One military contract, the great sin of the war economy is that one military contract could pay for all of the states that didn't expand the Affordable Care Act. And what if we had that in places like Mississippi and Alabama where we're having such high levels of death because people can't even go to the hospital? 
it always blows me away when we quote this in a poor people's campaign, our current military budget war economy is more than five countries combined, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, Iraq. Could that be one of the reasons we're, we're doing worse than them in our COVID response? Because we've taken hold of the sword. If we're gonna be nothing, we're gonna be able to blow up everybody. Our current military budget at $800 billion dwarfs the 200 billion, or between 190 to 200 billion allocated for education, jobs, housing. And one of the things we're gonna to have to start talking about, Jonathan, is, is, is not just does it, does it cost us when it comes to education, job, and housing. We, I, that Columbia study we used taught us something, that every regressive piece of public policy, every time we refuse to put money in the things that save life and put more money in militarism, Every regressive public policy has what I call a DM on the DL, a death measurement on the down low. In other words, people die from poverty. They die when they don't get access to education. They die when we don't have health care. And we're going to have to start talking about that. When you spend 54 cents of every discretionary dollar in the war machine of the war economy, and less than 16 cents in education and infrastructure, there's a deaf measurement and living wages, there's a deaf measurement. There's a deaf measurement. Right now, we've got a situation where only 39% of Americans can afford a thousand dollar emergency. There's a deaf measurement in that. And we need to start talking about it in those terms. And I wanna always challenge everybody on this cause to make sure that as we challenge the system, that we always use the word poverty and the poor, not just working people and working class folk. See? We have to talk about the death that is caused from poverty and the poverty that is caused because we've taken hold of the sword. And that death caused by poverty is in Appalachia and Alabama. It's in Massachusetts and Mississippi. It's among black folk and white folk. What we know is that these wars for the last 50 years have had really little to do with protecting Americans. Well, there's been a lot of profit, private contractors performing a lot of the traditional military roles. One study said there was almost 10 times as many military contractors per soldiers in the Afghan and Iraq wars as there were during Vietnam. And many of them making far more money than underpaid US soldiers. Army privates in combat earned less than $30,000 in 2016. And yet the top end of the pay scale of the disparities are even more extreme. In 2016, the CEOs of the top five military contractors earned an average of $19.2 million, 90 times more than even a US military general. But when we go back to those privates, we then turn around and make private is 640 times more than an army private. And many of our army privates are on food stamps. One of the things that we're gonna have to say is too many people are making a killing off of killing. It's just that simple. And we're going to have to expose that and show it and show the death toll a killing off of killing. And not just in this country. 2016, there was a 52% increase of civilian deaths from airstrikes in 2017. And most of them were women and children comprising 68% of these deaths. But when you take hold of the sword, the sword actually then ends up turning in on those who wield the sword. So in 2012, suicide claimed more military deaths than military actions. 2014, the risk of suicide was 22% higher among veterans than US civilians. 
by 2017, an average of 20 veterans were still dying by suicide each day. When you take hold of the sword, you perish by the sword. And then finally, why we must challenge this war economy is research tells us that 1 billion in military spending creates 11,200 jobs. You know, they always throw that out there, well, it's creating jobs. But the same amount of money would create 26,000 jobs if it was invested in education and 16,000 jobs if it was put into clean energy and 17,000 jobs if it was put into healthcare. So put into to, to, to education, you can create with $1 billion, 15,000 more jobs than you do putting it in the, mil the military mil war economy. And you can create 6,000 more jobs if you put it into healthcare. We also know that in the United States, in Vietnam 68, we had what military bases in 50 countries. Now we have 800. And if you add special forces to command to that, it's, a, it's another 149 countries. 149 countries. We spend $150 billion a year maintaining comfortable bases in Italy, Okinawa, Germany, but the water in Flint is still not safe to drink. The subway systems in Washington, DC and New York still have deadly accidents. And the schools in Baltimore and in South Carolina and all over this country don't have enough heat and many of them have lead in the paint and are run down all around this country according to our dear brother, David Vine. And you live by the sword, you die by the sword. When you take a hold of the sword, you perish by the sword. And so we must do exactly what this conference has said. We must loose the grip of the sword. We must loose the grip of militarism. We must loose that grip even if it's unintentionally given as Eisenhower said. And the only thing that can do it is an informed and enlightened and an organized population. All of us, all of us, even the lives of those who wield the sword, if we keep taking hold of it, it will keep perishing us, killing us, and undermining us. But we don't have to accept it. That's why my tradition teaches me Jesus didn't accept it on that Thursday. And it looked like the sword had won, that the militarism had won. But then later there was this powerful resurrection. Could it be? that right now in this moment, right here, right now, where it's so clear that if we weren't so holding on to the sword, we could be releasing people healthcare in the midst of this pandemic. If we weren't so entitled to the, tied to the sword, we could redirect some of that $800 billion into the things that are really creating national insecurity like poverty, the lack of health care, the lack of living wage. And could it be in this moment, in a way not seen since the peace demonstrations of Vietnam, that a resurrection is coming, that a resurrection is here, and that a resurrection of the calls for peace and the stand against the war economy is right at our grasp. And as my dear friend Larry Cohen said, it can't be five years from now. It can't be 20 years from now. It's got to be right now. Because if you take hold of the sword, you perish by the sword. 
But the logic of that text has a contrast. If you loose hold of the sword, then you live because you chose nonviolence over violence. Thank you all so much.